I'm truly honored to introduce the Mass General Hospital team who this month performed the first penile transplant in the United States. We're all extremely proud of this accomplishment three and a half years in the making. It involved extensive research and close collaboration across our entire Mass General community. We would especially like to thank our uh, president of the Massachusetts General Hospital, Dr. Peter Slavin, and his team, especially our vice president in charge of surgery and anesthesia, Ann Prestopino, our chief of surgery, Keith Lomo, and our chief of urology, Mike Blues, for their steadfast encouragement, support, and most importantly, trust. Uh, we're also pleased to have with us Alexandra Glazer. Uh, she is the president and CEO of the New England uh, Organ Bank, which has been so instrumental in uh, this effort. Alexandra will read an anonymous uh, statement from the donor's family today. And of course, due to confidentiality, we will not otherwise release any information about the donor's circumstances or his family. Our courageous patient, Thomas Manning, continues to be well, and we're optimistic about his outcome and future. Uh, Adam Feldman, and Mr. Manning's uh, doctor through all of this, will uh, read a statement for us today uh, on his behalf shortly. Our team leaders, Dr. Curtis uh, Citrullo from Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery, and Dr. Dick and uh, Co. from Urology and Transplant Surgery, will speak to us about the planning and procedure itself. Uh, but first, I'd like to acknowledge the many members of the surgical team who helped make this novel 15-hour procedure possible, including anesthesia, nursing, residents, and fellows, uh, many of whom are here today. I'd also like to mention the other lead attending surgeons with whom, uh, without whom this would not be possible. Dr. John Winograd, Dr. Kyle Everlin, Dr. Bronco Bojevic, and, and Dr. Frank McGovern, who each took charge and led uh, very particular and critical parts of this operation. So now I'd like to turn this over to Dr. Citrullo uh, and Co., our team leaders, to say a few words about this tremendous uh, milestone. Thank you very much, Dr. Austin. Good morning. Over the past three and a half years, my colleague, Dr. Kurt Citrullo, and I have been working on an innovative treatment for patients with severe and disfiguring genital urinary injuries. And from this point on, I'm going to use the word we, because not only is it we in the sense that we get the opportunity to sit up here, but it's we as a community, as a hospital here, that have seen this effort go forward. And I thank everybody who's here to make this possible. It's clearly a, a huge team effort. Um, there are many patients that uh, Dr. Citrullo and I have taken care of together who have had lost their external genitalia from trauma and cancers. These courageous survivors have often been left with a very abnormal urinary system, a loss of sexual function, and ultimately um, a loss of self-identity. Because of the location of their loss, this has become a very private affair for them. They do not self-identify in public. Their devastating losses are endured by themselves, alone, and often, and most of the time, in silence. So in 2012, Dr. Centrullo was giving his update on his uh, pioneering efforts in the hand transplant, and right away it became very apparent to us that your expert in plastic and reconstructive surgery, and my uh, background in urology and transplant surgery, is very compelling to put together a program that uses vascularized composite allografts to treat these patients with devastating injury. And with this, we forged forward to have a genital urinary vascularized composite allograft transplantation uh, study. The specific aims of what we were trying to do were threefold. Number one, reconstruct a natural appearing uh, external genitalia. Number two, to establish urinary function and uh, continuity of the, uh, of the urinary tract. And three, potentially achieving sexual function. We very carefully, as Dr. Austin mentioned, uh, put our later plans forward. We engaged our colleagues in plastic surgery, in trauma, in neurology, sexual medicine, psychiatry, and we seek the guidance from our respective chairmen and the hospital to move this forward. With a path that was clear, with extraordinary support, and um, we put a protocol together in 2013 and submitted to the internal review board of our hospital. We move this forward, but in the meantime, during the two years that we had to plan this, we went through cadaveric dissections, we assembled teams, we talked to all of our colleagues in the operating room, 
we had contingency plans and we had all our uh, buy-in from everybody that we've been working with. And it was a truly a team effort. It's a credit to all the people who are sitting in the audience. And uh, uh, Kurt and I are just very delighted to be able to speak about that uh, uh, from, from up here. Um, this is a huge, enormous uh, undertaking, and the New England Morgan Bank is also credited for making this possible because of their delicate and sensitive and enormous task of dealing with the donor's family. To that, we're very grateful to you to make this happen for us. At this juncture, thank you, thank you very much. Um, we see these uh, procedures as really along a continuum of providing cutting edge reconstructive surgical care to our patients. Reconstructing complex anatomy, like nose, lips, up or a hand, we see the same thing as these devastating general urinary injuries. So, like a hand transplant or a face transplant, we hope that this will be a common part of uh, reconstructive surgery going forward. We uh, focus on our own patients that we see every day and to begin with, and uh, we're hopeful that with, th with these successes going forward, that we'll be able to open this up to other uh, patient populations, such as uh, wounded warriors uh, returning from Iraq and uh, Afghanistan, who suffer these incredibly devastating injuries that can leave them so despondent that they consider taking their own, their own lives and often do. Um, we're very fortunate in a place like the Mass General with the institutional support we had, support of our IRB and our organ bank, uh, and most importantly our surgical colleagues who are, help us execute such a um, um, difficult, challenging procedure. Uh, we're very cautiously optimistic that um, Mr. Manning will continue to do well, and uh, he's a really an amazing patient and courageous person. And um, we're very thankful for the, for the donor's family who have made it possible. Happy to answer any questions about the procedure or the patient selection or the process going forward. I wonder about the, Mr. Manning himself. Uh, what is his current condition? How is he responding to it? Is, uh, Excuse me. Uh, um, if we could take questions after, we've got a, a statement from the patient uh, and from the organ bank first, if that's okay. Um, so I'd like to actually call up uh, Adam. Uh, Feldman, who's been uh, a, an important part of the team, and uh, Dr. and uh, Mr. Manning's uh, physician to read his statement. Thanks, Jay. The following was a statement from our patient, who, by the way, is an incredibly caring and unique individual, and we're really all lucky to have patients like him. In 2012, my life changed forever when I suffered a debilitating work accident followed by a devastating cancer diagnosis. Today I begin a new chapter filled with personal hope and hope for others who have suffered gentle injuries, particularly for our service members who put their lives on the line and suffer serious damage as a result. I want to thank the extraordinary medical team here at Mass General who helped not only make this possible, but quite literally saved my life. I would also like to sincerely thank the family of the donor whose wonderful gift has truly given me the second chance I never thought possible. I thank my mother for standing by my side and helping me through each step of the way. In sharing this success with all of you, it's my hope we can usher in a bright future for this type of transplantation. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you, Adam. I'd now um, like to ask uh, Alexandra Glazer from the New England uh, Oregon Bank to read the statement for the donor. Thank you. New England Oregon Bank is honored to be here today and to have collaborated with MGH in this groundbreaking donation and transplant. The collaboration necessary to successfully complete vascular composite allograft transplants relies on a number of factors, including the cooperation of the multiple transplant programs in the region and the remarkable skill of the MGH care team and surgeons. VCA transplantation, at its core, relies upon a donor family with the strength to look past their own grief at the loss of a loved one and see the ability to provide hope to someone in need. In this case, too, a family experiencing deep personal loss was able to say yes to this donation and give health and well-being to another person. There are not words to adequately thank a family for the selfless gift of donation that forever changes the lives of strangers. To this donor family, we offer our thoughts as they struggle with their loss and our humble thank you, deep appreciation, and admiration for the humanity that they showed. 
New England Organ Bank had an opportunity to speak to the donor family this weekend, and they want the recipient to know they feel blessed his recovery is going well and are praying for his recovery to continue. This family also wanted to share that donation has been uplifting for their family as it is helping them get through this difficult time. Thank you. Thank you, Alexander. Um, we're now open for questions. I just get back to the, uh, the recipient uh, and just wondering how he's physically <coughs> doing. Can you give us a little bit more of, of how he is and, and what he's experiencing and, and uh, what his long-term prognosis is? Sure. So um, he's doing well so far. I just spoke with him this morning. He's up and about, out of bed, and. Um, and progressing cautiously and conservatively in this course, but we think he's on a path to recovery. Um, he's emotionally doing amazing. I'm um, really impressed with how well he's handling things, and he's just a very positive person. And his um, his outlook is that he, he wants to share this technology with others who need it, and he is is one of those people who's open to he actually does speak with other people who've gone through you know, cancer and try to be supportive in that way. And he feels. Uh, that he can be able to do this even more so uh, to, to a greater extent now after going through the recovery. He, he was telling me this morning, he said, uh, just, if you just give a little bit of hope, it goes, it goes a long way to getting through such a devastating thing that he's gone through. Just to follow up on that, um, so there's no sort of, uh, at this point, uh, concerns about this is psychological well-being? Um, no, I mean, we, we went through a pretty rigorous psychological screening and, and um, made sure his motivations for this transplant were, were uh, appropriate, and in our view, they couldn't be more appropriate. He's just, he wants to be uh, whole again, he wants to not be, as, as uh, Dr. Coe said, in the shadows and, and um, about an injury such as this, and, and that really echoes what many patients with these kind of injuries uh, feel like. It's, it's something they can't even talk about, or they have difficulty even relating with their male friends or whomever, uh, and it just stays quiet and makes them isolated and oftentimes very despondent. So his, his motivations were, were perfect for as far as as far as we can find for this kind of procedure. And that really speaks to the fact that when I mentioned that many of these patients suffer in silence, and for years he's been like that, and I think now he's found a voice to come out to say. Um, how much he has really found hope in, in this type of procedure. So I think uh, a psychological evaluation of this patient has uh, been very good and very strong, and we know that uh, he should find a good way for recovery. Yeah. I mean, at the same time, we're cautiously optimistic. It's still early days, it's still early in his course, and we've learned a lot already. Um, but we're hopeful that you know, with this kind of experimental surgery, that we can learn enough to make it safe and routine. It doesn't mean it's all going to go perfectly all the time, but so far, we're doing okay. How far up do you see where it could be? I, it depends. It depends on a lot of factors on, you know, on you know, how we fund these operations, the research, and um, we, how we can manage immunosuppression. We have a research effort that tries to get rid of immunosuppression. That, you know, that would be a big leap in the right direction to uh, open this up to more, pay, more patients in the future. I understand there's been a couple of these internationally, uh, only one of which I believe was successful. Uh, I was only personally to confirm that. And also, your concerns going forward, the risk of rejection, um, what are you looking at going forward to, to make sure this is a success? Um, there's been a couple, two cases reported in the literature, uh, one in South Africa and one in China. Both were initially successful. Um, the Chinese patient, as far as we know, had uh, difficulties with the immunosuppression required to prevent allo rejection, and so yeah, eventually the, the, the allograft was removed. The South African patient continues to do well by all reports. Um, but as far as our concerns about uh, rejection, it's again uncharted waters. We've taken care of many patients that, you know, in over the world history and the world literature that have gone through uh, this one term it vascularized composite allo transplantation. They require the same immunosuppression that, for example, a kidney patient would require to prevent rejecting the allograft. So, uh, at least with our experience in our hand transplant patient, we follow the same protocol and, and um, we're hopeful that, that, that our patient will do as well as the hand transplant patient has done as far as rejection. He has not had rejection episodes, so 
we're hopeful that our um, protocol will be as effective in this case. But again, there are different tissues involved, different lymphatic tissues, so we'll just have to take it day by day and see how we go. Did you have any contact with the teams in South Africa or China or any of the other countries that you have So uh, the, the South African case was presented um, live at the uh, International Composite Tissue uh, meeting last spring where and, and we did have a more detailed view of, of their procedure and, and their publication as well. So, um, but in a, in one case, every case is somewhat different from the recipient anatomy and the donor um, procurement. So we really had to tailor our procedure to our patient and practice with the resources we had and the team that we had to make it work for us. So that, that took a lot of work from a lot of people in the audience. So it was really um, a team effort and we're unfortunate to have amazing surgical colleagues who can pull something like this off because it was, uh, it was you know, a real team effort. Uh, two questions. Is, um, is your patient, is he married? He's not married. And the second question is, does this, uh, this is, may consider, you may think this is way out in left field, but does this have any ramifications at all? Down the road, you're talking about wounded warriors and so forth. Does it have any ramifications at all possible for transgender people who want to um, sure, that's sort of, I mean, it's outside the scope of what we're, we're trying to get to it, but I, I don't see any, uh, you know, any contraindication to, to that being an option in the future. It's something we're thinking about um, in an academic sense, but um, again, the scope of our, our effort present is our, first our own patients that we can, that we can help and then hopefully open the door to other traumatic injuries, and if all goes well, that would certainly be uh, something you know, for us or other groups to entertain if, if possible. Technically, I think it's a possibility, whether it's um, immunologically, that'd be another question to ask, but sure. Can you speak to any of the unique challenges in particular of surgery are and why, sort of it took so long for, to get to this point, why, why this surgery? I mean, we've been doing transplants for a while, what's particularly hard to do this um, again, I think it's on a, a continuum of other transplants, hand, face, abdominal wall, all the soft tissue transplants, which fall under the same umbrella that we went for it. So as we gain experience with those other um, allografts, like a hand, I mean, we felt confident to be able to do this operation because of our experience with the hand, and how we manage them uh, psychologically, medically, immunosuppression standpoint. So I kind of took that experience to get here. And um, as we go forward, I think we'll be entertaining other complex anatomic units. Like it, hopefully someday I envision a, a nose, lips, an ear, a digit, something that things that are really hard to reconstruct with our, our typical um, means at this time. Um, we see that as this is just another extension to that. So it's a march. Um, on the right path, and I don't think it took any longer than our, you know, some of our other uh, protocols. It just takes a lot of work to make sure we're doing it correctly, especially when it hasn't been done before. So. On the urologic front, more or less, it's uh, it's an extension of the experience that's learned from all the traumas, and all the reconstructive surgery, what to hook up, where is the best vascular supply, and how to prevent structures or narrowing or complications from occurring in the future. So it's a real combination of a lot of fun. Um, expertise that uh, our entire team have gained in our daily, day-to-day -day work uh, to put it all together to do this composite graph. Just to follow up on the previous question about transgender surgery possibly, um, how much of a leap would it be to get to that sort of surgery based off of what you guys did here? Is, 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 is it? Um, I mean, it depends. It depends on some of those procedures. I would need to be worked out, but with people with a lot of experience in, in the anatomy. So I, I think it's, while it's on the same thing, we're, we're not quite there yet as far as the planning goes. I think it will take a lot, take another whole um, refocused effort to make sure it's safe and, and, um, and anatomically and surgically possible to do a good job at it. Yeah. Um, along the same lines, um, our team has had a lot of discussion about that as in view of um, uh, all the um, new stories and uh, what's been current in the last 18 months. Um, we put a focus on cancer and trauma as our first phase simply because we have to put a proof of concept 
uh, in terms of reconstruction, having a bit, uh, uh, putting together the parts that are available. Um, and the considerations into the future will take a refocus into uh, what is possible anatomically and what are uh, uh, the parts that need to be in place. That will come to further discussion into the future, but as of now, um, we have a lot to learn uh, from this procedure, and we have a lot to, uh, uh, to gain from the uh, further experiences over time uh, before we can make that type of leap forward. Um, I'm not sure if you covered this already or not, but how long did Mr. Manning uh, long as he had penile cancer, and how did that affect him you know, physically, emotionally? How was he deteriorating, <clears throat> suffering through that? So, so Dr. Feldman, who's, who uh, read his words, uh, has taken care of him for years, and he's been cancer-free now for uh, four years, and, and uh, Dr. Feldman will want to comment on his course. So, yeah, I can comment. He's, uh, he's a remarkable individual who coped very well with his diagnosis, but certainly felt the loss um, after his surgery, which was what's called a partial penectomy. Um, he's really an incredible person that after that surgery, totally unprovoked, said, Doc, if I can have a penile transplant, I'm your patient. And um, it was really amazing. Um, and, uh, and then shortly afterward is when the program started. Um, and I said, you know, there might just be here something. Might, might just be something here for you. Uh, so he's really a remarkable individual, but has had difficulty coping, and, 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 and just like anyone would imagine, um, and, but has always been positive. So. Talk about how you selected him. Um, sure. I mean, it, it takes a it's a process of, of um, being healthy enough for a surgery, being psychologically appropriately motivated, and um, you know, anatomically, psych psychologically, and um, you know, whether we could whether he would be able to comply with postoperative care and things like that. He turned out to be a very good candidate from that perspective. We also work with the uh, radiology department in this hospital, uh, which uh, also speaks to the amount of collaborations uh, at Massachusetts General Hospital. Um, we had a team that we would put together to help us defining the anatomical structures that are necessary for this transplant. Because each recipient is different. Each recipient has different levels of deficit, given the type of injury or the type of surgical procedure that they have. We had to perform um, uh, special scans, uh, MRIs, CTs, angiograms. All of this helped Kurt and I look at the uh, photos, uh, look at the images, to determine which candidate would have the appropriate vasculature that at least for the first one would have a very good chance of achieving success. Um, this allows us to take a look at what, uh, what the images have told us. Uh, this allows to uh, evaluate further pa future patients to see whether they need to have the same anatomy or different anatomy and how will we address these a little bit differently each time. So it's a very long process. And not only that, we have a multidisciplinary team that includes obviously psychiatry, uh, dietitians, social workers, and so on, uh, and medical, directors, medical um, individuals who are familiar with immunosuppression. We want to make sure it's safe and we make sure that these patients are individually assessed and we come together in a multidisciplinary meeting and discuss the candidacy. So the process is very well thought out and very inclusive to, to, uh, to move forward. Yeah, Dr. When you talk about the right vasculature for the first candidates, what, what does that actually look like? Well, it's an interesting question. I mean, our, our imaging um, show that our recipient vessels were quite robust, but uh, actually, interoperably, we had to go to a bit of a plan B. Um, Dr. Eberle and Dr. Boydebeck, who are two of our most gifted microsurgeons, were say, said that we can put these together, but the, they're going to be a small, very small anastomosis where you connect vessels together, and maybe it won't be as reliable as something we want um, to use. So we immediately went to plan B, and before we knew it, we had uh, Dr. Winograd was getting vein grafts, and we were bypassing the smaller vessels to, to provide a bigger. Um, inflow um, vessel to make sure that the transplant itself was, a, was more reliable. What is, why did you choose not to try to uh, reconnect the reproductive function? 
Um, well, it, it's a good question. Usually, we're, we, we're transplanting only non-germline tissue here, so um, that sort of was beyond the scope of the first proof of concept and something ethically that we are we're certainly not really ready to address. And um, our, our institutional review board agreed with us and with that approach, and, and so we went from there, sort of a, one step at a time. Functional reconstructive approach first. And also in the cancer patients, the penile cancer patients, the standard procedure does not include orchidectomy or removal of the testicles. Uh, so that's not part of the plan or initial consideration for these cases. Can you explain what are the ethical issues that were involved? Yeah, the ethical issues with, um, with transplanting reproductive organs would be transmission uh, if it is even possible of the germlines uh, of. of who would be following the child, etc. So I, I think there is there are considerations and ethical discussions that need to take place very much in depth with uh, ethicists um, uh, and uh, psychiatrists and, and other uh, individuals that we need to put together to see whether or not this is even something that one would consider. Um, so our initial motivation to do this is to reconstruct the external appearance, reconstruct the urological function, and perhaps achieve sexual function. So reproductive function was not our initial uh, aim uh, with this study. What is the patient's prognosis at this point? At what point do you consider this truly a success, or is it still something where you're continuing to be monitoring him to see if there's any sort of rejection? So, I mean, the surgical part we, we feel is, has been successful, um, but, you know, this is an allograft. It's, it's an, um, from an unrelated individual, and that requires immunosuppression for life, basically, until we can conquer that problem with immunologic tolerance research. Um, so it, it'll be constant vigilance. It'll, it'll have to be compliant with immunosuppressive medications for life, and um, there are sequelae to those, and there are problems even with standard immunosuppression with regard to uh, chronic rejection where it's, it can be sort of the immunosuppressive drugs tamp down your immune response, but, um, but the you know, rejection can still um, subversively occur. So it's going to be a, a lifelong struggle. With, with most of these patients, you get to an equilibrium where you're at a, a happy level of immunosuppression and um, they don't reject, and that's sort of where we keep them at, at um, as long as they can and deal with any other risks or complications such as that. The benchmarks that we have for determining the success that we'll discuss um, include early, intermediate, and late. And um, uh, some of the intermediate would include the urological component after the catheter has been removed. Will we successfully keep that conduit open in time without causing any narrowing? And uh, a later benchmark would be would there be a turn of sexual function as a result of the uh, nerve grafting and whether or not spontane spontaneous erections uh, uh, could occur. Um, so there are multiple, multiple benchmarks before we can call this. This is a wonderful, perfect operation uh, that is 100% successful. So we're, we're a ways from there yet. With the immunosuppression, is there a risk throughout his life of, uh, of uh, skin cancer, uh, let's say of one third, for the rest of his life? Of lymphoma, say 1 in 100, or other types of cancers, and uh, how long uh, can he expect this uh, a transplant? Uh, you don't have any stats, any, any way to average, but uh, how many, for how many years can you expect this to be uh, operative and okay? Those are great questions. Yeah. Um, those are great questions. I'll try to address them one at a time. Uh, immunosuppression uh, in all patients uh, also present, as you say, a potential of having increased risk of infection and increased risk of having uh, cancers, in particular the ones that are skin cancer that you mentioned. The interesting thing is that in the penile cancer, which is of the same uh, type of uh, uh, tumor um, uh, as skin cancer, uh, being a cell, um, there are actually uh, pharmacological agents that we use as immunosuppression uh, that belongs to a family that over time uh, there is a medication that may decrease, may, uh, decrease the likelihood of recurrence. So we're entertaining that as part of our study. Um, uh, so in terms of a lymphoma, there is a chance of occurring, but it's not one in a hundred, it's less than that. 
and we're very vigilant in monitoring their levels of immunosuppression and also the uh, likelihood of rejection. So far in the hand transmission, it's about four years out now, and he hasn't had any rejection or any other complications related to that. The vascular com composite allografts may be a little bit different from solid organ, uh, and I think um, you know, with time we'll be able to better answer those questions. Uh, our patient is very aware of those risks, and we have outlined it to them very carefully about what's the ongoing potential. This might be a question, but uh, Dr. Feldman, but uh, is Mr. Manning, uh, I assume that he's still here, possible recovering, when, and how long do you expect him to be here, and when do you expect him to go home? I would prefer oh, that. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> Sure, I think, um, you know, we're, we just want to keep an extra conservative hospital course, but he's getting close to the point where we think we can get him to at least a step-down facility or, or home with close monitoring to make sure he's with close follow-up to keep a close eye on this uh, uh, course. So In layman terms, what's, what's that mean? Three or four days. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and when would we begin to expect to uh, have a urinary function? Is that the... Um, right now, we are going to leave the catheter in as a stent uh, or as a, as a bridge uh, for approximately three weeks. Um, usually, with uh, severe stricture disease, um, we often keep that, uh, the catheter in for a number of weeks uh, to do that. And in this case, uh, with immunosuppression, we want to be on, on the cautious side, and we thought that three weeks would be a reasonable time frame given the experience that's been out there. How many cases of this, of the penile cancer, are, uh, are there in the United States every year? Does anyone know the statistic? Um, so um, each year there's probably under 2,000 uh, penile cancer cases a year. Um, it's a very uncommon disease. The, uh, the incidence is less than 1 in 100,000 men and it occurs in, uh, it's less than 1% of all male cancers. So it's a very uncommon type of cancer. Um, it is, um, uh, uh, there's higher incidence in other areas of the world such as Asia, Africa, South America, uh, where uh, neonatal circumcision uh, is rarely practiced. Uh, so that's one of the, the, the risk factors is, is uh, being uncircumcised at birth. Uh, smoking is a risk factor as well. Um, and um, also uh, 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 human papillomavirus and uh, AIDS. It's a very uncommon diagnosis, but it does affect patients uh, and, and, and has a significant, can have significant de devastating uh, circumstances. Along the same lines, how many people do you think would eventually benefit from this surgery for penile cancer and complications that we had? And is there anybody currently on the wait um, so it's a, it depends on really the, the populations that we're able to serve. It broadens as we get better at the procedure and um, the immunosuppressive complications can be managed. But uh, there are at least, there are many, one of the impetuses for this was um, our, uh, Dr. Coe's fellow at the time was coming from Walter Reed and um, an experienced urologist who was himself even personally devastated by this in the, in the general urinary um, the urologic unit from from um, when the warriors coming back, there were many many who could who could benefit from this, and, and he that's why he got on board right away because there was a real patient driven need, and we see it ourselves. I mean, uh, as Dr. Feldman said, he wasn't aware that we could do this, and when, once he heard, he was immediately responsible and dedicated enough to his patient to make sure he at least got valuable for that. And we have another patient that our burn colleagues have referred to who's um, a good candidate and you know the problem is that these, these these folks don't realize that there are options or any hope out there so we think that as as this gets um, we become more comfortable with it then maybe more patients will think that they're, that they're uh, that's a possibility for them and more um, physicians who are caring for them you may also find them referring to it. so at the moment it's hard to say but there are plenty of people we know who need it so enough to keep us busy for a while can you talk a little bit on, on the benefit to uh, veterans, young men from Afghanistan and Iraq? I'm sorry? Can you elaborate on the benefits of this, uh, if you have success, what this will mean to many uh, veterans, men between 18 and 35, uh, psychologically? Yeah, I, mean, I can only, um, based on the current baseline, uh, which is pretty um, 
pretty sad, and, and uh, you know, these babies are very despondent, and they, they often consider taking their own lives. They don't have very much hope for their for their uh, for intimacy going forward in their in their life, and they've already sacrificed so much in in, uh, um, serve, in the service of their country. So, it, you know, I feel like it would be um, a really important and life saving in, in some cases um, procedure for someone uh, who's in that circumstance. <coughs> Did you already talk about the donor? Can you tell us what we know about him? And did he know that he was going to be donating this particular organ? Okay. So we're not going to be commenting specifically about the donor in order to protect confidentiality. I would just say in general, the practice is that uh, even if an individual is registered as a donor, this requires special permission and a different approach to the family after organ donation for standard organ, solid organ transplant has been already discussed. So in terms of our process, that's the way it works. Um, and other than that, we're really not going to be commenting about the donor specifically. So he consented while he was still alive. So if there was a registered donor, that permission is not what we use to move forward for this type of donor recovery. We would approach the family for specific authorization for this specific graft. And that's been consistent for all of the BCA protocols. Can I ask for just a couple of ABCs? So could you translate into lay language? What is a composite vascularized allograft? And what was the operation you did in several steps? Sure. So uh, the vascularized composite allograft that this term has evolved over time. It started out as a composite tissue allograft. Composite just means different kinds of tissue. For example, when you um, <coughs> transplant a kidney, it's really mostly all kidney cells. When you transplant a hand, for example, you have nerve, tendon, blood vessel, muscle, bone, so it's composite. Um, now, tissue was removed from the term and vascularized was inserted um, due to reflect how the, um, the organs are managed by an organ bank rather than a tissue bank. A tissue bank is regulated by the FDA and it's not something that has a um, short shelf life and needs to be revascularized very quickly like an organ or a kidney. So this is, is regulated and um, similar to an organ that needs to be vascularized within eight to eight hours or so to, to be effective. Um, so that's where the vascularized came in and, t and tissue, and then allografts, it just means tissue from somewhere else. Um, and, and it really applies, if there's a, if, if to confuse the situation, there's reconstructive transplantation is also another um, blanket statement for these kind of transplants, and now even restorative transplantation has been used, but they really mean the same thing. It's, it's soft tissue transplant, a hand, abdominal wall, face, generally urinary tissue, and we're hopeful lower extremity at some point um, or other, other more um, specialized tissues like a digit or a year, you know, so. Um, as far as the steps of the operation there, it's similar to um, procurement of an organ. The, um, the, the organs identify the, the family and the organ bank um, provides that service and they, they really are um, on the show as far as making sure that we uh, have attention to the life-saving organs first and that's the priority. Uh, we work with them to, to um, procure our allograft in a safe way and, and, and at the same time our, our recipient team begins to work and we coordinate um, the two procedures at once and, and try, to, try to make it as efficient as possible and we're fortunate at MGH to have a group of really gifted people who are able to, to make that work. Then, so then the allograft is brought back to the recipient hospital where the operation is already in and um, undergoing, and then we can sort of make the two, uh, put the allograft on and start reconnecting things and reperfusing things. Two questions follow up on that. It sounds like actually all of this must happen really quite quickly in order for the organs to still be useful. Can you tell me from the time that uh, the, the hospital was notified that there was a, a donor to the time that the surgery actually was happening, how long did that take? And secondly, I'm wondering if other organs from this same donor went to a number of other people as well. So I'll uh, defer the second question to the organ bank. Um, but uh, it, it's a process that it comes from the organ bank, and they say we have a potential, we may have a potential donor, because, so they can alert us to have a, a, our team on standby. But that process evolves over time. 
Um, so by the time there's a really a go for the procedure, we're all sort of we're all ready, we already have a plan, and oftentimes it doesn't happen. It's just like where there's a stand down, and um, in that process, we prepared even more for the time when it really happens. Did you say how long it was between the time you found out and when it actually happened? I think it was about 24 hours or so, 18 hours. Do you think there was a sense of what it's like for a physician or a surgeon to participate in the operation? Do you want me to bring the answer? Yeah, sure. You want me to let her answer that? You had asked if uh, there were other organs recovered and transplanted. Yes, this donor saved multiple lives. Did you say how many? I'm going to stick with multiple. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so we, for me, it was a great experience. I mean, uh, our, the surgeons that we work with are, are really incredibly skilled, and, uh, and it was great to see them all at the top of the game. And it's just like a team that's playing well when things are going well, and everyone doing their part at, the, at, uh, at a high level. And that's all the, the combined synergy is what leads to success. And I, you know, I think everybody, everyone feeds off of each other's um, desire to make this work. And, commitment to the patient, their commitment to their uh, craft or surgery. I mean, this is a 15-hour overnight operation, which we can only blink an eye at. And there were, there were many parts of the operation that were handled incredibly skillfully by members of this team that, that would, you know, tag in and out and, and get the work done at a really high level. So that's the only way to make something like this work. It's not um, in any way possible without a large-scale team, like both nurses, anesthesiologists, and surgeons. To that point, um, there's two questions I'd like you to follow up, uh, follow up on. Um, yeah, the time point was, was quite interesting because it was at a time that uh, all the urologists in the United States are meeting in San Diego. It was the American Urologic Association annual meeting. You can't get any further away from Boston than in San Diego. And the fact is, Kurt did such a great job organizing, and we did so much work preparing our teams. I called upon my colleague, who was left behind, Dr. Francis McGovern, to get everything rolling while trying to get the first flight back from San Diego, stuck in at LAX. So Dr. Francis um, McGovern uh, did uh, all the initial uh, part, got, every, got everything started with the plastics team, and then uh, Dr. Feldman, Dr. Tamricott, and myself were on standby. I got the first flight, thanks guys. <laughs> and uh, my wife came to pick me up at, uh, in the middle of the night at the uh, airport to bring me directly to the operating room. So, um, you know, in, in terms of putting this all together, it was, it was a huge sense of um, collaboration amongst the whole group. Um, uh, not only that, because we had residents and fellows who were at the American Urologic, Dr. Kai Lee, who was one of our residents, went on with your team up to the donors to, to uh, uh, have input there as well. So overall, we pulled together and got everybody involved. I think that is a really uh, impressive show of what planning and uh, the skill sets that's available to, in this hospital uh, to have the majority of your team in San Diego and still come back and be part of this is, a, is an outstanding, uh, uh, which, uh, you speak of outstanding achievement from this hospital and from the team that's, that's here. Approximately how many doctors and nurses worked on this? Uh, seven attending surgeons, uh, six to seven fellows, residents, over 30, uh, including uh, anesthesiologists, uh, 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 nurses, uh, circulators, uh, rotating. Uh, I would have to say close to 50 that was part of this team. It was an enormous effort. And that, uh, you know, not to be not inclusive, there's a lot more have been involved in the pre-op area, admitting the patient, post-op care, the rotating shifts that have been taking care of this patient in and out uh, throughout the last uh, week and a half. Um, it, it is really a tremendous effort. So 50 is actually a conservative estimate of how many people have been able to help us uh, with this program. I have a, a clarification on something Dr. Feldman said. When you were, uh, he was talking about um, Mr. Manning um, saying that he would be a good candidate for uh, a penis um, uh, transplant. And you used a term, I'm, I'm not sure, I didn't quite understand, but am I to assume that part of his penis or his penis had to be removed because of the cancer, and that's why he needed the transplant? 
That's more lay, these are lay, layman's terms. Right, so in 2012, he underwent a surgery that's called a partial penectomy. So in penile cancer, um, today in 2016 and in, in 2012, we make every effort to conserve as much of the organ as possible. And that, of course, depends on the level of invasion of the cancer itself. Um, and, but uh, he himself had to have a, a significant portion of the external portion of the penis removed. And, and, uh, and that you know, left him with a, a, a stump that uh, um, we had hoped he would be able to, to urinate while standing, but um, you know, he had some difficulty with that, um, as he's spoken about. Uh, and the uh, stump that was left really left the opportunity for uh, a successful transfer. Well, if there are no further questions, do you want to I do have one further question. Um, what about sensation? The previously successful transplant, did the patient have return of sensation, and do you expect that to be the case with your patient? Um, I, can't, I haven't examined the um, previous patient, but I can't comment, but uh, we do expect return of sensation when we did that with careful um, nerve reconstruction, which we have a lot of experience in, so um, we're hopeful that. And actually, the immunosuppressive drugs that we use very potent um, for nerve regeneration. It's one of the few benefits of, of, um, of the drugs that we use to, to prevent rejection. And so we noted that in our hand transplant patient, one of the reasons he's got such great recovery is probably because of the, not only the hard work of physical therapy, but the, um, the, the drugs help nerves regrow. So we expect, that we expect good sensory return. Do you have any other candidates for a, a penile a transplants? Uh, we're screening one. patients uh, um, you know, that prefer to us pretty frequently, so hopefully we'll have more. Hoping to, hoping to do another um, one this year, as soon as this year, or? When, whenever it happens. Can you comment on the technical differences between the transplant you did and the other two teams uh, in China and South Africa? Um, one of the, the differences was using a, a vein graft to um, go from a large vessel to, uh, to make sure we have very good inflow. I don't believe that they, they did that. And, um, but other than that, they're, they're pretty similar. All right. Well, thank you very much for being here.